John. And I, uh, I want to begin by saying a very big thank you to all of you. And uh, you've cared for me a lot over the years, probably in ways that you don't know. And you've prayed for me. You've uh, financially supported me. And uh, you've helped me to walk with Jesus here and uh, in foreign lands. And so I owe you a deep gratitude. Thank you very much. And uh, now um, the slide above me makes me cry when I see it. And so on uh, this side of the slide is Solomon. My dear brother in the Lord, Solomon is an Ethiopian refugee that was living in the land where I lived. And uh, refugees have an exceptionally difficult life, but Solomon loved God. And uh, you've prayed for Solomon since uh, March the 22nd last year. He was taken by national security. Uh, he was tortured for about six weeks. And from there they moved him to immigration prison, which is the worst despicable of conditions you can ever imagine. And uh, on February the 3rd, they released Solomon from prison, and this picture was taken the next day, the first time he had touched his wife since March the 22nd and the of last year, and the first time he had seen his children. And I spoke with Solomon this week. They've been relocated through United Nations High Commission on Refugees and the Red Cross to uh, a Nordic land to begin a new life. And I called them this week, and for 45 minutes he gushed his thankfulness to God and to you who have prayed for him. And so I thank you for praying for Solomon. We acknowledge that it is a miracle that he is released from that prison. And I can't go into all the details about that, but it is a miracle. And we really thank you for your prayers for him. Solomon thanks you with all his heart. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit, tacking on to what John was saying, go back to his talk about the second law of ther thermodynamics and entropy, which is the gradual decline into dis into disorder. And John said in his talk that things become more chaotic, less predictable, and more broken over time. And 26 years ago, that summed up my life. I'd been married for 18 years. We had three children. We had a beautiful home. We had no debt. We had a sailboat, a vintage car, and all of the things that I had been told would bring peace and joy into my life. But we didn't have peace and joy. We had chaos. And the longer we, I tried to work with it to keep it together, the more chaotic it became. And our life had moved from honeymoon to disaster zone in a very short period of time. No matter what I did, whether I worked hard as being a good wife or working at my job or raising our children to be responsible citizens, it only ended in chaos. So my search for peace 26 years ago led me to leave my husband and to take my children and start life again. Because of course, I thought that Tom, my husband, was the cause of all my problems. But it wasn't long before I realized that Tom wasn't the cause of my problems. It was me. I was the one that had the problem. I learned quickly what I had read later in Jeremiah when he penned that my heart was deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Well, back in those days, when I had uh, thought about the separation from Tom, there was a man that came to our office from another province to work with our company who was dealing with a merger. I was, like I still am, a rabble rouser and confrontational, and I was never afraid to speak out. So I quickly was in his face demanding answers to what he was going to do with this chaos of this company merger. He calmly replied to my questions, and his peaceful demeanor in the midst of my unraveling world really ticked me off. This man, whose life appeared to be under control, and I saw Jim as one who had it together in a very strange way. And I have no idea why at that time, but it really bugged me. So my goal was to undo Jim. So at that time, I wanted to see the company conditions improve for their employees, and over time, I learned that James, Jim had the same vision for the company. So after a few months, Jim, who worked in the head office, asked me, who worked in the branch, to come and work for him in the head office. Well, he is, his boss, John, 
had warned Jim against this idea. John and I, we drank a lot of beer together over those years, and he warned Jim, you know, she's not like you, Jim. She'll go, she's going to drive you crazy. But Jim ignored his warnings, and from the beginning of the first time I started working side by side with Jim, there was just something I noticed. One of the things I noticed was that he didn't swear, and that really intrigued me, and it was probably because every second word out of my mouth was a swear word. My sister often commented on my garbage mouth, and to be quite honest, I was quite proud of it. Another thing that I saw about Jim that intrigued me was that he was very faithful to his wife of many years, and that was actually despite my efforts. But of course, Jim, John, took great delight throughout this whole process and reminded Jim often, I told you, she's not like you. She's going to undo you. Jim didn't smoke. He didn't drink. But that was okay with me because I smoked and drank enough for the both of us. And I especially enjoyed smoking in his office and watching the look on his face. The one main thing that intrigued me about Jim was that he never seemed to get upset. I saw terrible things happen to him. Spiteful corporate politics are not nice, and he was often on the receiving end of that spitefulness. But he never lost his cool. And even when I would storm into his office and slam my fist on his desk and scream at him, why don't you just get mad some days? They treat you like a doormat. His calm response would always be, do you think that'll help? Has that helped you? So Jim was the epitome of peace in the midst of my chaos. In my business world and in my home life, it was this peace that he brought into the conversations that caused me to say to him, what makes you tick, buddy? And one day, after we'd been working together for almost a full year, his response to that question was, I'm a Christian. And I just replied, what the hell has that got to do with this conversation we're having? <laughs> and he explained to me in the days after that what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And I can sh assure you that none of it made sense to me. I tried religion. It hadn't helped. My, light was di my life was difficult enough, and I wasn't about to add the pressures of going to church and becoming religious. But Jim kept taking the conversation away from going to church and becoming religious and talking about God in a way that I'd actually never heard before. After working alongside of him for a few more months, I'd made the decision that I was going to leave my husband and start life again. Jim seemed a little challenged by that, and of course I would just tear into him like I did every day about how his life was easy and that he just simply didn't understand the hell that I was living with. So one month after I separated from my husband, I had to go to court regarding custody of my kids. I went into work that day and I told Jim I had to leave early to go to court, and he said, okay, before you go, be sure to come into my office. So at 10 o'clock, I ran in and I said, I have to go now. And he said to me, before you go, I want to pray for you. I can't even begin to tell you how shocked I was when he said that. In our year of working side by side, he had never said that. I was very embarrassed. He asked me to sit in the chair across from his desk while he would pray. I panicked. I started a barrage of questions. Do I have to close my eyes? Do I have to bow my head? Do I have to sit down? Why can't I just stand up? Are you going to pray out loud? And as always, he calmly responded, please sit down and be quiet. <laughs> so I threw myself into the chair begrudgingly and sat there rigidly embarrassed and hoped that no one could hear what was going on. I waited for the one word that I knew was coming that I could get out of there. When he said, Amen, I bolted for the door. Went to the court, and an hour later, there was a miracle in that court. My lawyer had already told me that I was going to lose my children. But the judge granted us joint custody. 
And I can't go into all the details of that, but I can tell you that I immediately knew that it was somehow connected to that man praying.